old were you when you first learned about sex? And then how old were you when a parent decided it was time to talk to you about it? <laughs> it started for me in the fourth grade. I was in the girls' bathroom at school, and my friend Stacy pulled me into the stall, and she told me all about the bases. And that home run thing, nasty. <laughs> I was shocked, I was grossed out, but I was intrigued. I was curious, I had a lot of questions. And I decided that day that I was not going to ask my parents about that stuff. My formal sex education came in the seventh grade. I uh, learned it from some shady video and a demonstration involving bananas. And my mother diligently followed up afterwards by handing me a book and asking me if I had any questions. To which I replied, no ma'am. I mean, I had already been talking about sex with my friends um, for three years and giggling about it. I wasn't about to start that conversation with her. Uh, and besides, I was a seventh grader. I knew everything. And despite my avoidance of mature conversations about sex at that age, I somehow became a gynecologist. <laughs> and I specialized in pediatric and adolescent gynecology, which is a fabulous specialty, but it does come with a harsh reality. Every day in my practice, I was taking care of girls who had been sexually abused. I was taking care of girls who had started having sex too young. I was treating their sexually transmitted infections. I was caring for pregnant teens. And every day, I was dealing with issues related to the lack of sexuality education and the shame and embarrassment that enshroud our conversations about it. You know, some things have changed a lot. Some things haven't changed. What hasn't changed is the fear and anxiety we have when it comes to talking to our kids about sex and sexuality. But what has changed drastically is the way our children get information when they're afraid to ask their parents something. Today, teens basically have 24-7 access to high-definition video of a variety of sexual behaviors. They get relationship advice from other teenagers who have established themselves as experts on a YouTube channel. And any third grader knows that you can type a word into a Google search box and get a full page of images or details. And in fact, by fourth grade, half of all children have seen online nudity. It's because boobs is a popular search term. <laughs> But a third of them have seen pornographic images, whether intentional or unintentional. And by fifth grade, in our state, one in five students has had sexual intercourse excuse me, by seventh grade. And by high school, one in 10 has been sexually abused. But the average age of sexual abuse is nine. And then there's this trend that's very bothersome to me. There's a near epidemic of young adult men who are seeking treatment for erectile dysfunction. It's been attributed to pornography addiction. The fact that they masturbate to pornography throughout the years when they're conditioning their sexual response means that their relationship with a real human doesn't work the same way. So I would say the stakes are very high. It's time for us to get rid of our shame and embarrassment when it comes to talking about sex with our kids so that we can promote healthy sexual development and safe development. There's enough out there that's promoting unhealthy development. And I'm sure that when we pass down our shame and embarrassment to our kids, it prevents them from asking their questions and telling their stories and advocating for themselves when it comes to their own emerging sexuality. And if we're going to put an end to the shame and embarrassment, we have to figure out where it begins. Where does it start so we can stop it? I put a lot of thought into this. And I'm convinced that our shame and embarrassment begins with the informant. The person who gets to tell the story first 
sets the tone. And for kids in America, the informant when it comes to sex is usually none other than a fourth grader, typically with an older sibling. I know this because every year I get emails and phone calls from near panic stricken mothers whose little darlings have come home from school and they've learned about sex from a friend. When I think about this, there are always two phone calls that come to mind. One of my friends called me. Her daughter, Katie, had come home from school and、um, she was crying. And her mother finally got out of her why she was upset. And she said she had learned what sex was. And she knew that it involved being naked under the covers with wiggling and poking and horribleness. And as her mother tried to calm her down, her father came home. And she screamed at him and said, How could you hurt mommy like that? Those parents had no idea how to back out of that conversation and set the story straight. And、the other phone call came from the mom of a boy. He came home from school, similar story, had heard about sex from some peers. And he sat there at the table, kind of quiet, shaking his head, almost dumbfounded. And he finally looked up at his mom and he said, Mom, I just can't believe Princess Leia would allow Han Solo to do that to her. <laughs> At that point, all a parent can do is backpedal. It's not easy. So, what if we could bypass this whole fourth grade informant thing? What if you could become the informant? You can. You just have to beat them to the point. And based on that, from my professional experience, from my experience as a mom of three, and yes, I have tried this at home, I'm convinced that eight is great. Yes, eight years old is the perfect age to talk to your kids about sex and reproduction. And I know you parents are going, oh, that's so young, they're so innocent. But it's their innocence and their ability to understand it that makes it the perfect time to talk to them. They're not embarrassed, they haven't attached any negative messages to the, to the talk. And it's not just to prevent the drama at home, there are actually other reasons why eight is great. If you could be the first person to talk to your child about sex and reproduction and give it the awe and wonder and respect that it deserves, you're setting the tone for your child to have accurate information from a reliable resource. And when they hear other things on the playground down the road, they'll know the true story. Another reason I already alluded to the average age of sexual abuse in our country is nine. Children who understand sex and the appropriate context and boundaries for it. Are less likely to become victims of sexual abuse. And the last reason, and one that I think is most transformative for those of us in the room, if you can talk to an eight year old about sex and reproduction, it is the perfect way to unzip your own awkwardness and embarrassment when it comes to talking about sex. That's because they're not embarrassed. They're not embarrassed in the least, they'll ask great questions. Some will be technical, some will be humorous. You'll find yourself having this conversation that's direct and simple and laced with humor. And that's the perfect way to start a long term、uh, thing with having these great conversations. So, if I've convinced you that eight is great, let me finish up by giving you three tips on how to have this conversation effectively and efficiently. First, you're going to talk it up big. You're going to make it a special occasion. Tell them you're going to tell them something very special on a special occasion. And tell them you haven't been able to tell them that before now because they weren't old enough to treat it with the respect and maturity that it requires. That way, you're. <laughs> oh. We're a little early with that. That way.、Um, You're already instilling some confidence in them and you're emphasizing the importance of respect. Secondly, you're going to do some homework. You're going to go to Google Images and download some pictures eggs and sperm and embryos from chickens and cows and humans. They all look very similar and it's fascinating. Fetal development in the uterus and the birth process. That starts a great conversation. And last, you're not going to drop the bomb until you're ready for the conversation to end. So, you can finish by saying, How do you think that sperm gets to that egg? 
And when you say penis and vagina, that's when you get this. <laughs> it's a normal reaction, and it's okay. Your child will be ready for the conversation to end at this point, and so will you. <laughs> so with that, you have opened the door to release the embarrassment and shame. Your child will be ready to run off and play with their Legos, and you can stop and give yourself a pat on the back. Because you've just opened the door to releasing the embarrassment and shame associated with these conversations. And that will change the culture that your child grows up in. So keep talking. There's a lot more to talk about. Stay the informant. And good luck. <laughs>